Although having covered what cloud storage and cloud computing are, and some pros and cons of them as concepts, let's now talk about some choices you have to make when you are deciding what cloud provider to choose. Now, judging by the length of the video, you'll know there's going to be a lot to cover in this, lots of different talking points, lots of different things to think about. And in the exam, you might have to evaluate two different providers, or at least discuss some of the choices which would have to get made, some of the implications of this choice. Now, it is a, quite a big choice because there are lots of different cloud providers. There are a few massive ones. So the ones on screen here, you'll recognize a few of these at least. Azure is Microsoft's cloud provider. Um, AWS is Amazon's. So some big companies here who sort of dominate the cloud computing market. Now, cloud computing is really a big company's game because if you are a big company like Microsoft, Amazon, Google, you can afford to set up massive data centers with state-of-the-art servers and security teams and so on. So it's hard for smaller companies to join the market, but there are some and there are choices to be made. And some of the high level considerations include things like stating the obvious a little bit, but the number of features available. That's true for every technology purchase, I suppose, but you want a good number of features. You possibly don't want too many. If you are looking for a very simple setup, some of these might be way too complex for you. So the actual complexity could be a factor. Some people want relatively complex features, which they can go in and tweak and adapt and be in control of. Other companies will be happy just to sit back and let Google or Dropbox handle it for them. Now, often as a way to get people introduced to their service, some accounts, some features might be provided for free. And so you might have a choice of, well, actually, do I need to pay for this service? The price is obviously a factor as well, but you could decide, well, actually, Dropbox gives a free version. We don't need more than two gigabytes, so we're happy using their free version. It's not worth paying for the plus version to get two terabytes for a lot of our accounts, right? So some, some small companies might not need the actual pro versions, which a lot of big companies wouldn't have to go for. Other factors will include what devices are compatible. Most major companies now have got apps and desktop programs and web interfaces, but some might not work with certain devices, especially going towards cloud computing. You may not be able to use a web interface on an iPad or an iOS device more generally, or an Android or whatever it is, right? It may not work on some devices. That will be a factor. And finally, the interface design will be a factor as well, something which you would have covered a lot in other aspects of this course, but we want it to be accessible and available to all employees and clear and not cluttered and so on, things which not all cloud providers are good at managing. Now, just to drill into some of these a little bit more and to sort of categorize a load more questions which have to get asked when you are weighing up this choice. And this choice, I think, does seem quite arbitrary. Like for you, it might not matter really at all if you choose iCloud over Dropbox. It's a pretty similar choice and have very similar prices. Doesn't make much difference for you probably and for me. But if you are a big company and you're paying potentially millions of pounds for your cloud storage, it will make a difference who you pick. So factors will include how you get set up. You clearly want to get set up quite quickly. For individuals, very simple, you set up an account. For companies, you might have to, for example, migrate all of your data from your current setup into the cloud setup. This could take days and days and days of slowly transferring, could be thousands of terabytes of data onto the cloud. A lot of uploading, a lot of moving. That is not always a quick process. Potentially the cloud provider might help you with this, but not necessarily. And when it is set up, you want to know how well it's going to integrate with your current systems what we might call our traditional systems. So you just draw standard storage, which is local. But we want to have some integration. So working together, because clearly you're not always going to be online. We want to have some capacity to work offline as well. And it's not always seamless. It can be a bit clunky to go offline online. You may not be able to work in some cases without it being online. So it's not always a great system. Often there'll be some way to work offline which will somehow integrate so to, for example synchronization is a way for you to work offline you go back online and it will synchronize what's happened in the meantime the issue can be sometimes if it can't connect or if you get logged out by mistake or you forget your password there become some issues so this message here is from microsoft word where i was logged into my cloud storage 
but I think I signed out or something like that and it blocked the upload because it couldn't synchronize it with my online storage and so it's not always seamless right this annoyed me a little bit because effectively I could have lost my work if I didn't log back in so it's not always a, a perfect integration between the cloud and your normal systems another massive massive consideration for modern companies is security and we'll talk a lot more about cybersecurity in future videos but just as a high level discussion you need to be doing some research into what security the cloud provider has now to be fair if you are choosing a provider like microsoft or amazon it's fair to assume they have got good security but it's not guaranteed it becomes more key if you're choosing maybe a cheaper option which you haven't really heard of or it's based in, in another country um, you've got to be aware of what they're doing if you search on youtube for data center security often there are adverts from google and amazon effectively giving you a tour of their security to try and persuade customers they are safe which they usually are but not always now part of this will be looking at the disaster recovery policies i'll have a video which covers this in much more detail but generally this is the plan for what what to do when things go wrong or if things go wrong so if there is a cyber attack if there is a flood if there is a fire how is the company going to respond to it that's obviously quite important because if all of your data is in this building and there is a fire or it gets hacked or something severe happens you want to know they've got a plan in place to recover it and not cause too many issues that's in terms of their policy but also you as a company should have a policy as well does it align is there some connection if you have a flood at your building are you able to quickly restore from their backup are there ways to link the two policies together another factor will be where the data is held in the world some countries have got better laws regarding data privacy than others here is a map showing what the eu considers to be an adequate place to hold data Interesting, the UK is not highlighted here, but I assume that's a Brexit issue. Uh, but different countries have got different laws. Not all of them are strong enough, according to, for example, the UK or the EU. Now, the security should be getting better over time, ideally, or at least not getting worse. So the maintenance is important. So really, maintenance is about how are the cloud provider managing the service over time? You're paying for it every month, so it should continue, if not get better. An aspect of this will be software updates. This is especially true for cloud computing if you're running programs on the cloud. It's really crucial that programs are updated, not only because you want to get the latest features, but more importantly for your security, bugs can be hidden in the code. A bug is some issue, some error in the code, and it's the most common way a hacker can gain access to computers. They can exploit bugs and hack into the data. Now, if it's being updated, in theory, the bugs get fixed in the updates. It's called a patch. So if you're not updating regularly, you are potentially vulnerable to attacks in that way. Now, an important consideration will be whose job it is to do that. Is it your job to inform the company or to do the updates yourself? But more likely, it's their job and you want to check they are actually doing it. And there shouldn't be a delay. So it should be done quickly. Delays mean the attacker is able to exploit it. And on a broader point about maintenance, downtime is something many customers of cloud computing will be fearful of because downtime means the servers go down and you can't access the cloud computing at all. Now this is pretty rare for big companies nowadays because they can manage heavy loads and they can switch to backups quite quickly, but it can be an issue, right? There can be a flood, there could be a cyber attack, there could be a fire and it could mean the service goes down and it can really, really affect the customers of that cloud computing. And potentially linked to this downtime issue, there could be a lot of downtime if the staff are not very good. You should want to know how expert are the staff working at the cloud data center. You'd hope there would be a dedicated team of engineers, of security staff, highly qualified people there all the time to try and reduce the risk of downtime or make it quick if it has to go down for a while. But that's not guaranteed, right? Also, you should know, you should want to know how much expertise do I need? Do I need to be able to set up this network? Have I got to do a lot of work to maintain my end? Or can it be handled by the cloud provider? Different companies will want different levels of control over this process. Finally, let's talk about performance, a really important factor to end on. This is really how responsive are the cloud services going to be to the user? So to put it more clearly, 
is it going to buffer? Is it going to be laggy? Is it going to crash all the time? We want a nice, consistent, speedy service. By definition, cloud storage and cloud computing, you're accessing it via the internet. And we all know the internet can be slow and can be inconsistent sometimes. The speeds are not always the same, especially across the day or across the week or across the year in some cases. At peak times, things can slow down because the servers can only respond to so many people at once. Other factors will be actually how exactly is the cloud provider set up? Are they investing in good devices and good communication technologies? Are they going for fiber optic cables everywhere instead of copper cables? Are they going for the speedier storage devices like SSDs over magnetic hard drives? Are they going for top of range hardware in their servers, high in CPUs, high in GPUs? Are they investing? And are you able to access these good resources? Now, some of these do not make much difference on their own. Right? Having a fiber optic cable as opposed to a copper cable in a building makes a very little difference unless it's a very huge building. But it's all about what investment are they making? Are they improving things over time? It doesn't bode well if things are quite old and prone to breaking. You want to know top of a range equipment is being used if you are paying a lot of money for it.